my dear friend, I hope you'll not find today's ramblings too lengthy or uninteresting, but I write of the subject of my mind, and that is this. I must have a new Easter dress. You may remember this resolution from last year and many years past. It is one I have resolved on nearly every year and accomplished with varying degrees of success. I think the spring weather makes my fingers itch to be making. Or perhaps I feel the deep need, like the flowers, to burst upon the world in a resplendent splash of color. I've resolved to create a dress in the Victorian style. Specifically, I've been moved to attempt a facsimile of the 1860s wrapper dress, which was first brought to my attention by the glorious Dames a la Mode of YouTube fame. Dear friend, if you have not delighted in her company, I must urge you most vehemently to visit her virtual workshop post-haste. I believe I shall base my gown, differing from the inspiring lady, instead upon a Janet Arnold pattern from her most informative Patterns of Fashion 1, the 1840s morning dress to be more specific, and simply adapt the front to the stylings of a wrapper dress. A wrapper dress is, after all, the 1860s era morning dress as well. Drawing up patterns is somewhat tedious, but is a labor well served. Thankfully, I already drew up the pattern to my size during the whole red death process. I shall skip some of the tedium, and if you desire more information on my process, pray express so in your next writing. I carry it on with the usual mock-up, fitting the pattern to my long torso, of which I have complained to often. The fabric I've chosen is a lemon yellow luxe quilting cotton lined in an unbleached muslin. I loved the color and feel of the supremely soft cotton so much I bought the entire bolt on an impulse. Impulse purchasing, I'm afraid, is a flaw that must always be forgiven, for it has no hope of being cured. Perhaps you will find it of little interest, but I hope you will indulge me. As I indulge my desire for an Easter dress, I couldn't help pondering the origins of the Easter dress. As many things from antiquity, there's hardly a straightforward answer because, quite simply, no one wrote things down as often as I should like. My curiosity brought me to start a conversation with Master Google, who obligingly brought me to an article claiming the idea stemmed from the celebration of the ancient Germanic goddess Yoster, which led me down an interesting bunny trail. Yoster is a little-known deity over whom a few niche scholars engage in a heated debate. She is referenced primarily in an early medieval Christian work focused on calculation of the date of Easter, a confusing story in and of its own right. In 725 AD, the prolific Benedictine monk and scholar the Venerable Saint Bede of Northumbria wrote De Temporum Ratione, otherwise the reckoning of time, to help monks calculate Easter. While outlining his rationale, he details various calendrical schemes and writes a sort of history of the earth. He gives a helpful commentary on the traditional Old English names for the months with a brief discussion of each. Some of his etymologies seem to refer to the agricultural cycles of the year, such as Weodmonoth, August, or Weed Month, or the one which amused me most, Thrymilkomonoth, May, Three Milking Month, so called because in that month cattle were milked three times a day. I am delighted that whole months were named after chores. Bede says two months were named after goddesses, including Yostermonoth, April, after the supposed fertility goddess Yoster. Brother Bede writes, Yostermonoth has a name which is now translated Paschal Month, and which was once called after a goddess of theirs named Yoster, in whose honor feasts were celebrated in that month. Now they designate that paschal season by her name, calling the joys of the new rite by the time-honored name of the old observance. While some call Bede's credibility into question, there are other sources that corroborate, and I personally am inclined to believe there was a Yoster goddess and that the Anglo-Saxons used the name of her month for the new Christian festival, since their celebration dates more or less align. Although new is a bit of a misnomer since Christians have been celebrating Easter in the spring since at least the 2nd century AD, which is nearly 400 years before Christianity came to jolly old England and found any devotees of Yoster. To quote one Tim O'Neill, whose master's degree specialization is in historic analysis of medieval literature, and whose history of Easter and Yoster I am much indebted to for the preceding information, the only thing Yoster seems to have given Easter is her name. So, if not from Yoster's celebration, then from whence does my inescapable tradition of Easter dresses spring? I made new inquiry of Master Google, and the earliest reference I found attributed to the introduction of elaborate Easter ceremonies, including displays of fashionable dress, was to the Roman Emperor Constantine I in the 4th century. 
According to Father Francis X. Weiser in the Easter Book, as the newly baptized Christians in the early centuries wore white garments of new linen, so it became a tradition among all the faithful to appear in new clothes on Easter Sunday, symbolizing the new life that the Lord, through his resurrection, bestowed upon all believers. This custom was widespread during medieval times, in many places a popular superstition threatened with ill luck all those who could afford to buy new clothes for Easter Sunday but refused to do so. It is an ancient saying in Connemara, Ireland, For Christmas, food and drink. For Easter, new clothes. A 15th century proverb from Poor Robin's Almanac states, At Easter let your clothes be new, or else be sure you will it rue. Samuel Pepys, an administrator of the Navy of England and Member of Parliament, who is most famous for the diary he kept for a decade while still a relatively young man, wrote, 30 March 1662. Having my old black suit new furbished, I was pretty neat in my clothes today, and my boy, his old suit new trimmed. Very handsome. There is even reference of Easter finery in Romeo and Juliet, with Mercutio's taunting of Benvolio. Didst thou not fall out with a tailor for wearing his new doublet before Easter? The New York Herald noted in 1855, There is an old proverb that if on Easter Sunday some part of your dress is not new, you will have no good fortune that year. Later, it went on to say, with the establishment of the Easter Parade in 1873, they were a gaily dressed crowd of worshippers and the female portion of it seemed to have come out en masse in fresh apparel and dazzled the eye with their exhibition of shade and color in the multitudinous and variegated hues of their garments. The New York Times reported in 1890, It was the Great Easter Parade, which has become such an established institution in New York that the curious flock to Fifth Avenue almost as numerously and enthusiastically as they do to see a circus parade. And the concept of the Easter bonnet was popularized by the song Easter Parade in 1933 by iconic singer-songwriter Irving Berlin. In your Easter bonnet, with all your frills upon it, you'll be the grandest lady in the Easter Parade. And of course, I cannot neglect to mention the 1948 film Easter Parade, starring Judy Garland and Fred Astaire. Though recent COVID times cancelled the pageantry of 2020's Easter season, it hardly can be a reason to neglect this year's Easter garment tradition, if the fancy strikes you as it does in me. My dear friend, whether it be symbolic of new life or of statue or a sign of fortune, I find myself rather pleased with my new gown, and I shall endeavor to wear it on more occasions than simply Easter. For I am inclined to believe, as those with a historical bent must agree, that practicality is queen when it comes to such things. To wear it new for Easter is a pleasure, but to have a well-made garment to be well used for many moons is a treasure. Now I fear I have kept you too long already, my friend, and so I must bid goodbye. Fare thee well, wherever you may fare. Affectionately yours, F.F. <laughs>